in the Harvest Time series, as you know. And the theme verse, as I want to begin every, every sermon with, is John 4, 35. And it reads like this. It says, and again, be sure you understand, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. He says, do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And so we're in this Harvest Time series, and, and we're at the halfway point. It's an eight-week uh, message ser series. We're at the halfway point. And before I get into today's scripture, I just want to be sure that we're hanging on to the intentionality of this series. I want to make sure that we're getting it, that we're hanging on to it. And so I want to do a quick review. Going back to week one, the first message was see like Jesus. And it was from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And in that message, we were learning how to see like Jesus, how to care like Jesus, and how to pray like Jesus. Since that message, are you seeing, praying, or caring any differently than you were before? Has that changed any part of your life? And then in week two, we had the message entitled Seeds for the Heart. And it was found in Matthew 13, 1 through 23. It was the parable of the sower. And that parable of the sower, we learned, was a picture of gospel seeds and heart conditions. Remember that? And we learned that we must sow many seeds everywhere if we want some seeds to sprout and produce Fruit. And so I would ask you this question, are you being a sower and scattering the seeds of the gospel anywhere and everywhere? Then in week three, we have the message keys to a joyful life that was found in John 15, 1 through 16. And Jesus' words taught us that the secrets of to a joyful life was first being connected to the vine. And, and we know in that parable, the vine represents Jesus. We must be connected to Jesus. But it went beyond that. There was more than that one key. There was the other keys of abiding in the vine. Spending time with the Lord every day. Listen to His voice. And also bearing fruit. And loving one another. And I would ask you this question. Are you connected <laughs> abiding, bearing, and loving. Are you doing those things that we learned from that message? And, and then in week four, we heard the message living with good and bad. Also in Matthew 13, another parable in verses 24 through 43, and it was the parable of the wheats and the tares. And it explained to us why there's both good and bad in the world. We learn that the Lord is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so I'd ask you this question. Are you willing to suffer the bad for the sake of those who need the Savior? Jesus was. He suffered as bad as anyone could suffer. And He did it for the sake of people who needed a Savior. And so that brings us to today's message, week five. And the title of this message is Let Your Life Change Lives. And today's message is found in John 1, verses 19 through 49. We'll be looking at all those verses. And here we see the first messenger of the gospel and how he touched all the people around him. Inspiring them to become followers of Christ. And we'll see how his life changed lives. I want to back up a little bit and explain the context of where we're at historically. And there's a much overlooked period of time in the Bible that I dare say very few people spend any time thinking about. I call it the period from silence to voice. And what I'm talking about is that between the Old and the New Testaments, it's believed that there was about 400 years of silence from God. Think about that. Imagine it. Roughly 16 generations and there's no prophet speaking. 16 generations, 400 years without any word from the Lord. No recorded presence. 
No guidance from the Holy Spirit. No manifestations of the angel of the Lord. Nothing but silence. Try to imagine that. I can't imagine going one day without hearing from the Lord. I can't imagine one day not, not touching Him, not, not listening to Him, not being in His Word, not praying to Him. I can't imagine one day. And listen, if I was praying day and I, I think about those 16 generations. What if you're generation number eight? And you're hoping and you're praying and you're looking for anything spiritual and your whole life, nothing comes. I can't imagine what that was like, but it was 400 years of silence. So do you know who the last Old Testament prophet was? Do you know who that was? Malachi. Malachi. Absolutely right. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and Malachi was also the last Old Testament prophet. His message was to confront God's people and their leaders with their sin. That was his message. He was to plead with them to return to holiness because judgment day was coming, and he did that. Four brief chapters where God exposes sins, warns them of judgment, and then silence. No more communication from heaven. But Malachi did not leave them without a promising word. In his prophecy, he gives a prophecy of a messenger. Malachi pro prophesied of a messenger, a voice preparing the way before the Lord. In Malachi 3.1, it reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to His temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And you know what that promise was right there? That promise was that after 400 years of silence, it would end with a messenger's voice. And so we need to... Look at that first messenger. But you may be sitting here going, how does this relate to me? How, how, explain why you're preaching this to us. Well, this is a day and time that this world desperately needs a voice that stands up and prepares the way of the Lord. And yet so many believers are sitting silently by. We need to go from silence to a voice. We'll see today that once a person opens their voice, lives are changed. In other words, we must be messengers with a voice. And so let's look at this first messenger of the gospel. And, and it's a voice in the wilderness. And we see it in John 1, 19 through 28. And I want to read it and you follow along with me. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said unto him, Who are you that we may give answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Listen to what John says. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you who you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The voice in the wilderness. You know, John was a Jew, and he believed in a Messiah to come, but he hadn't met him yet. 
And yet he becomes this voice. He's been instructed by God to be the forerunner, to make straight the way of the Lord, as he quoted here in Isaiah 40, verse 3, which actually reads, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, I, as I read that, I thought to myself, how did John know? How did John know that he was the voice? And it really doesn't say there, but then I, I got to digging a little bit, and I realized that John's story is in all four Gospels. You know, there's very few stories that are recorded in all four Gospels, but John's story is one that was in all four Gospels. And, and as I looked over in the Gospel of Luke and read a story there uh, in Luke 3, 2 through 3, it shows us that when the word of the Lord came to John, he immediately went out preaching a baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. He became the voice crying in the wilderness. Here's what I'm saying to you is that, that it doesn't say it here, but in Luke it clearly says the voice of God came to him. That's how he knew he was going to be the voice. That's how he knew that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah because God spoke to him. That's how we know where to be a voice because at one point in your life, God spoke to you and your life changed. God spoke to John and he became John the Baptist. His life changed. God says, I want you to start preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins to prepare the way of the Messiah that's about to come right after you. I want you to go ahead and start preaching that message. And that's exactly what John done. He was a voice in the wilderness. And, and then we see that the voice becomes a witness. Look at verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me, referring back to what we read in Luke, that God sent him. He said, he who sent me said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Just the day before, it's not recorded here, but it's recorded in all other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Just the day before this, Jesus had come to him to be baptized. And, and John immediately knew that it was the Lamb of God. And he says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, suffer it to be so now because I want to fulfill all righteousness, John. You baptize me. And after he baptized him, it says Jesus came up out of the water. And that a dove came down from heaven. It was the Spirit in the form of a dove. And it lighted on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And John experienced that. And God had already told him that's how it was going to be. And that when he saw that, he would know that that was the Savior of the world. And so you can appreciate it when he says in verse 34, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Exactly like God told me it would be. The voice becomes a witness. John proclaims, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's a witness in verse 29. In verse 30, he proclaims, this is he of whom I've said. That's him testifying of Jesus. And then in verse 32, it says, And John bore witness, saying, John, the voice in the wilderness, becomes a witness of the Savior. John gave his personal testimony of how Jesus was revealed to him. From silence to a voice to a witness. That's the formula of how our lives can change lives. John simply become 
the one that would share his personal testimony. God told me I would see the Messiah come, that, that I would see the Holy Spirit be sent upon him, and that I would know it was him. And then he says that I saw it when I baptized him. The dove come down and lighted on him, and it was the Holy Spirit. I heard God speak from heaven that this was his beloved son. And you know what? From that day on, he was telling that story to everybody and anybody that would listen. Did the Lord ever dramatically touch your life? If He did, that's your testimony. You say, well, it wasn't that dramatic when I was eight years old. I said, VBS, and I prayed to receive Christ. Oh, that's dramatic. That's life-changing. For some of you, it was as an adult. I mean, everybody has their own testimony. Everybody has their own story. But if you're sitting here today and you're claiming to be, be a believer, then you have a testimony of how you met Christ, how He changed your heart, and how He changed your life. And, and you should be so inspired by that that you want to tell others about it. And that's who John was. The, the voice became a witness. And the witness changed lives. Look at verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood up with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, seeing them follow, and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. So once John was introduced to Christ, he immediately began to testify to those around him. He had experienced a supernatural reality that he couldn't deny and he couldn't be silent any longer. Standing there with two of his disciples and Jesus walks by and he goes, Behold the Lamb of God! And how it changed those disciples' life. Verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Wow! He just said, Behold the Lamb of God! And they said, Okay, we're following Him. We're following Him. And, and I would ask you this. Do you have a voice for the Lord? Do you have a testimony to share? And do you share that testimony with the people around you? I call it your realm of influence. See, here's the thing is that I have my realm of influence. A lot of my influence is in Kennesaw, Georgia. An hour drive from here. That's my world. That's my realm. Where is yours? I mean, you're going places. You're meeting people. You're, you're, you're knowing people that other people in this church don't know. That's your realm of influence. That's where you need to be sharing your testimony. Here's John. His realm of influence was two disciples standing next to him. And he says, behold, guys, there's the Lamb of God. That's who you need to follow. And they started following him. So start thinking about what is my sphere, my realm of influence? Who are the people that I should be testifying to? I mean, narrow it down. You can't change the world, but you can change your world. Narrow it down. Start looking at people the way that Jesus loves people. Start looking for people. Who can I speak to? And that John had no problem telling his disciples that that was the Lamb of God. And then they quickly followed him. Do you have a voice for the Lord? Do you have a testimony? And are you sharing? I, I like to call this causing a change reaction. Now you've heard people say a chain reaction. One after another to another to another. I like to call it a change reaction. According to Wikipedia, as of 2020, Christianity has approximately 2.6 billion adherents to the faith. Out of a worldwide population of about 7.8 billion people, you know what? That represents about one third of the world's population today. It's the largest 
religion in the world by numbers. Christianity, largest religion in the world. And I want to ask you this question. How did that happen? When we read these humble beginnings here. When one speaks to another and another speaks to another to the point of where it's 2.6 billion people that have not only heard but received the message of Jesus Christ. That just blows my mind. It happened when those who received Christ tell others, then they believe and they tell others who then believe and they tell others. We, we need to be creating a change reaction. We need to be causing a change reaction. And, and we can't do it in silence. We have to do it with a voice. We have to tell people who Jesus is to us. We have to share our testimonies with them. And once we start sharing, I think we will be totally blown away at what God will do with your voice. We see this example of John to Andrew to Simon. Look at verse 40. It says, One of the two who heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called uh, Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now look at that for a minute. Andrew follows Jesus because of the testimony of John the Baptist. You see that? And then what does he do in verses 41 and 42? Andrew then goes and gets his brother Simon and brings him to Jesus. So it goes from, from John to Andrew to Simon, a change reaction. And their lives were changed. Here's another example. From Jesus to Philip to Nathaniel. Look at verse 43. It says, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, and who is no deceit? And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So we see that Jesus calls Philip to follow him. Philip believes he follows him. And, and even though Nathaniel was cynical about it, Philip encourages him to come and see. He says, just, you just come see for yourself, Nathaniel. And once Nathaniel meets Jesus, he proclaims him the Son of God. Listen, once you bring them to Jesus and they meet Jesus, then their life changes. A change reaction. When's the last time you said to someone, I found the Savior, come and see? That's a simple sentence right there. I have found the Savior, come and see. And even if they're a little bit cynical, just encourage them, just come and see. That's what Nathaniel did, and he was introduced to the Savior, and without a doubt, he accepted Christ. Change reaction. I think about another one that's a few chapters over in John 4. It's Jesus to the woman to the town. And you know, I'm referring to the Samaritan woman at the well who brings her whole town to Jesus. And I'm going to read verses 39 through 42 in John chapter 4. Listen to the story. It says that many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. What if she would have never found her voice? What if she would have never went back to town and testified, just come back smiling, feeling good, just going on with her life, but never tell anybody 
Well, I can assure you, if she would have never testified, nobody would have ever come, from, come to Jesus, as we're about to see that happens. It says, He told me all that I ever did. That was her testimony to them. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard Him, and we know that He is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Because she went back, and she found her voice, and she shared her testimony, then people said, we got to go meet this guy. They probably didn't really know what they were coming to see. And by the way, our key verse that we're reading every week where he's speaking to his disciples and he said, do you not say that there's four months to the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look for the harvest is white and ready. You know that verse that we read every week? It's from this story. And you know what's happened? Is that the woman is sitting there with Jesus and she's realizing He's the Messiah and she's receiving Him and she's all excited. In the meantime, His disciples are coming back from that very town that she's about to go to to get food. And they're coming back with the food and, and they're wondering, why is He talking to her? And, and she gets up and she leaves and she goes back to town and, and it's a whole big story. But the point of it is this, is that they said, Jesus, why are you talking to that Samaritan woman? And that's when he said, do you not say there's still four months to the harvest? They go, yeah, that's what we say. He says, I'm telling you, lift up your eyes. And you know what was happening? All those people from that town was coming to see Jesus. And when He told them to lift up their eyes, I believe they looked up and they saw the whole town coming out. The town that they had just went to. The town where they were silent. We can't afford to be silent. But it only takes one voice. It only takes one person to get on fire like that lady did that day, sit by the well to go back out into the town and, and inspire everybody to come and see. From silence to a voice. You know, church people, they want to rely on the pastor. They want to rely on handouts. Listen, nothing wrong with handouts. We've given out a bunch of them. They want to rely on social posts on Facebook. They want to rely on the sign out of the street. But I'm going to tell you, you put the results of all that together. The pastor, the flyers, the Facebook, the YouTube, the sign out in the street. Whatever it is that you think is going to get the job done, you combine all that together and none of it will come near to amounting what a voice can do. Because this is how God's ordained it. This is the great commission. Go and make disciples. Go and win people to Jesus. Find your voice and tell people about Jesus. Find your voice and invite people to church. Find your voice because the voice is what draws people in. How many years of silence before we really find our voice. That's what we got to ask ourselves. If this message has convicted you, if you realize today that you're kind of a silent witness, then change that today. There's a saying that I've heard often, and it sounds good, but in a way, maybe it's not. And... It goes something like this. I can only paraphrase it to the best of my memory. Basically, it says, be a witness. And if you have to, use words. And the intent of that is, if you live a life that shows how good you are, if you live a life where you love people and serve people and minister to people, and, and, and eventually maybe they'll think, well, there's something about them and 
and, and they'll be drawn to you. But, and, and that's a good thought. We should live such a life. We should live such a life that people say, what's different about you? That's an open door to say, Jesus. We should live that type of life, but we can't just be a silent witness. we got to find our voice. You need to find your voice today. You need to ask the Lord, begin to pray, Lord, who do you want me to share Christ with? Who do you want me to be a witness to? Who in my family needs Jesus? Who in my neighborhood? Who in my realm of friends and co-workers? Or just if, if you ask the Lord to show you, He will show you and then you'll have to respond to that.